The city is Tunis, the country is Tunisia, and this is Northern Africa. It's my first time on the continent, and based on what I've seen so far, I'm loving my decision to come here. There is one place here in Tunis that stands above all the rest in terms of being a must-see location. That's the Medina of Tunis. I'm going to explore this place today, as well as take you to a few other sites that are worth visiting outside of the Medina. To begin, we'll stay right in the Medina. This place is vibrant and colorful. There's a sense of excitement as soon as you step into the narrow alleyways that are lined with vendors. Just about anything that you can think of is for sale within the Medina. Some areas are devoted to clothing, some concentrate on metalware, and some offer numerous types of spices. The different types of markets are referred to as souks. It is all fascinating, especially if this is the first visit to an area such as this. Medina means city, so this is essentially the old city of Tunis. It is massive, covering a total of 668 acres. It is recognized as one of the most well-preserved Medinas in the entire Arab Muslim world. The Medina of Tunis is designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It achieved that status in 1979. The UNESCO listing notes that there are around 700 sites or monuments or features of cultural significance within the Medina. It also talks about how this old city stood as one of the greatest and wealthiest within the Islamic world for a period of 400 or 500 years from the 12th to the 16th centuries. The Medina dates back to the 8th century. That means I'm walking through about 1400 years of history. The influences over that time have been many, from Arab to Berber to Ottoman to Andalusian to French. I am not much of a shopper, but I have heard of some tips that will help those who are. It is said that the farther into the interior of the Medina you travel, the better the quality and the better prices that will be found. These shops are also where customers are expected to put their bargaining skills on display. The merchant will begin with one price, but through the process, the item being considered can typically be purchased for a quarter to half of that. It is part of the experience, and it is an expected part of the transaction. These narrow streets and alleys of the Medina wind around, making for sometimes confusing maze. There's a reason for that. It was done as a defense against invaders, and also it creates a natural cooling effect. This is one of those places where you can easily get lost. I did a number of times. Keep walking though and you will eventually come upon a familiar landmark or emerge onto a street where your navigation app will be more effective. There seems to be one avenue where you will encounter the majority of people moving in both directions. It's quite crowded at times, but following along with the masses will usually lead to an outlet. Maybe it's just when I've been here, but one thing about this place has really surprised me. It's a lot quieter than I anticipated. I thought every vendor would be shouting in an attempt to attract business. The Medina is not just shopping. There are obviously restaurants and cafes. There are residential areas. There are mosques and there are schools. It truly does have everything that a typical town would offer. Enthralled by all that was around me, I explored this place on a couple of different days and for a total of three or four hours. With all that discovery, it is possible to work up quite a thirst. I found this little tea shop in the Medina and decided to give it a try. The shop is small, but its tables and chairs are spread through one of the alleyways. I had heard recommendations for mint tea, so that's what I ordered. It took only a few moments for it to be delivered. This is tea with pine. It's traditional here in Tunisia. So it's actually tea with pine nuts and mint. Not regularly a tea drinker, but let's see. Very hot, very flavorful. Oh, that is really good. Sweet, didn't ask for sugar. I'm sure there's some in there, but this is really good. Mint tea is the traditional drink of the people of Tunisia. It is quite common in some regions for it to be served with pine nuts. This provided a refreshing break in the middle of an active day. One aspect of being in the midst of the Medina is that there is no true sense of scale. All you see is what is in front of you, then the scene changes as you turn a corner. People can be very helpful, however. 
a guy directed me to this shop. It looked like dozens of others that were located nearby. Upstairs, though, the place opened up to the sky. It is a little bit difficult to find, but it's totally worth the effort. I've been to several places in the Medina. This is the best view that I've seen. I mean, just look at it. This was the most magical spot. There were views all around, in every direction. It was possible to see almost the entire Medina, and it was here that you got a very good idea of the size of the old city. More than that, there were tile mosaics of tremendous beauty. The entire terrace was full of this artwork, just adding an extra special bonus to the incredible views. The mosaics were colorful, gorgeous, and very, very intricate. Probably the highlight was this arch. Incredibly decorated, it provided a phenomenal frame for the views of the Medina that was beyond. It was stunning. Altogether, this was probably the most picturesque part of the entire Medina experience. The shop had all sorts of items for sale. One room near the view was full of rugs of different sizes and various colors. They were amazing, but I was not in the market for a new floor covering. What I was in the market for was lunch. I'd seen this beautiful space in the Medina a couple of days before and became determined to treat myself. The name is Fonduc El Atarin, and I found it to be the most incredible choice. I was served bread and a plate of appetizers, which was all delicious. Then came the three-course meal that I ordered. First course is the soup. Let's give it a shot. There's pasta in there, a little bit of tomato. There are some greens in there. I don't think it's spinach, though. Very tasty. It's quite nice. In no time, both the appetizers and the soup were gone. It was then time for the main course. The entree is a beef stew type dish. It's got carrots, chickpeas, some greens, other vegetables in there. Let's give it a try. The beef is unbelievably tender. A lot of flavor in here. Everything, it seems, has a little bit of spice to it. Nothing is too overwhelming, though. This is really good as well. I'm enjoying this meal. Just look at that plate of food. Huge chunks of meat and vegetables. And finally, there was one more course, dessert. The first two courses, I had no idea what I was going to get. I got the soup du jour and the plate du jour. I know, very original. But for dessert, it's lemon sorbet. Strong lemon flavor, very smooth, very creamy. This is a good choice. I ate every bite of all three courses and for the entire time just felt so happy with the food and my surroundings. And it all ends with a little mint tea. Really good meal. It was 53 dinar, which is $17.12 American. So I would say very much worth it and quite an experience here. I love this. What's not to love? Great food and a place that looks like this. If you are ever in the Medina of Tunis and you see this yellow door, walk on through. You won't be disappointed. Back amongst the shops of the Medina, there are a group of craftsmen that have recently been recognized for their abilities. You see and hear them through the soup where you can purchase metalware. They are engravers and they will etch whatever you would like into silver, gold or bronze to create a personalized memento of Tunisia. They work with a hammer and chisels, and they get the job done quickly. Their ability to instantly produce attractive engravings is astounding. Just recently, the UNESCO organization drew attention to these craftsmen by placing them on the intangible heritage list. This art form has been developed over centuries here in Tunisia and all across Northern Africa. It was an honor to see it done in person. There are numerous religious sites in the Medina. The most prominent of those is the Al Zaytuna Mosque. It covers more than an acre and has nine entrances. This is the oldest mosque in Tunis, dating to the 7th or 8th century, with the current look being the result of a renovation in the 9th century. As I was admiring the structure and its courtyard, I was approached by a traveling mint tea vendor. I couldn't resist. It was a bargain at one dinar, or around 30 cents. 
My first exposure to the Medina here was during a fantastic free walking tour close to when I initially arrived in Tunis. Riyadh was engaging and informative as my guide. Medina is just a city, so you know what we are going to expect inside. We will find markets for a long time. Uh, Arabs were known for trade. It was a tiny tour group, just Riyadh, a mother and daughter from Argentina, and me. We all learned a lot. Markets very important component of Medina, but they are not the only thing. You will find, of course, houses, mosques, schools, and a lot of uh, public baths and a lot of okay. other facilities. We roamed through the Medina for a couple of hours. It was apparent that Riyadh was proud of his country and the Medina and wants as many people as possible to experience this place. Medina of Tunis is the oldest Medina designated as Tunis that was in 1979. So it's the oldest one. This is why you have to come here when you visit Tunisia. The main way into the Medina is through one of the ancient gates of the old city. This is called Bab el Bar which translated means the gate of the sea. It is also called Porte de France, or the gate of France. There used to be 24 gates like this on the wall. This serves as the boundary between the Medina and the new town. This plaza is an attractive place with a fountain. It draws a lot of people who stop and take photos on their way into the narrow streets of the Medina. The Medina is famous for its market, but there's another market not far away. This is the municipal market or central market of Tunis. It is where many locals come for vegetables, fish, and more. I found the area where vegetables were for sale to be particularly enticing. The variety of products was impressive and the wide array of colors was spectacular. Some of the displays were quite creative. Imagine all of this to sell lemons and only lemons. The vendor even grabbed my camera and turned it in my direction. Another popular item at the market was dates. The country produced almost 400,000 metric tons last year, which places it in the top 10 in the world for the growing of dates. This is a thriving market, and prices for everything that was offered look to be exceptional. All of the vendors, too, are quite friendly and seem to be having fun with their jobs. The market here opens at 6 a.m. every day of the week and closes at 4 o'clock, but you really want to get here early because it's almost two o'clock now and things are already starting to wind down. A bit outside of the center of town is a museum that is considered one of the best in Africa. It is the Bardo Museum, and experts say it is second in Africa only to the Egyptian Museum of Cairo in terms of its collection. This serves as the national museum for Tunisia and contains items from all over the country. The place is enormous, and there is more to discover in every room that you enter. The museum is recognized as having one of the best collections of Roman mosaics in the entire world. Most of them are made of tiny colored pieces of tile. They are everywhere and they are magnificent. The mosaics were uncovered in various sites around the country. They now adorn the walls here, as well as the ceiling and the floors. They are so plentiful that at times you walk over mosaics which just seems wrong. Other types of pieces fill the museum with sculptures of many kinds. The setting here is a 19th century palace, which simply adds to the appeal of the place. Some of the displays are dazzling, and I spent a couple of hours thoroughly scouring the building. I gathered so many clips of the place, far more than I could ever fit into one of these videos. It was all just awe-inspiring. The Bardo Museum is open again after a fairly long closure. It has dealt with a lot through the years. The doors were shut during the Tunisian Revolution in 2011, and then of course COVID caused disruptions not long ago. The most jarring closure, however, came after a terrorist attack here in 2015. 22 individuals were killed by a couple of militants, and around 50 people were injured. Most were foreign tourists. Today, a tribute to the victims fills a prominent spot inside the museum. There are a couple of other attractions or parts of Tunis that I want to mention. At one of the busiest roundabouts in downtown, there is the clock tower. It is 38 meters tall and surrounded by a water feature. It's a kilometer or so from the Medina, but I used it a number of times as my drop-off point when taking a cab to this part of town. 
Leading toward the Medina from the clock tower is Avenue Habib Burguba. It is a wide boulevard with the center portion meant for pedestrians. It was crowded each time I walked along it, but still had a relaxing feel. The new town, which surrounds the thoroughfare, is modern with plenty of cafes and restaurants. There is such a difference between it and the Medina. Kesbah Square is not far away. City Hall is located here with a cool monument standing in front of it. The square is surrounded by numerous other buildings that are quite attractive. Tunis contains one of the most unusual buildings I've ever seen. This was the 406-room Hotel du Lac, which closed in 2000. An example of brutalist architecture, the top floor of the 10-story building is twice as long as the bottom floor. It's like an inverted pyramid. Some say it could have been the inspiration for the sand crawler in the original Star Wars movie, but others say that is doubtful. A walk of a kilometer or two from downtown lands you on the shores of the Lake of Tunis. This is a shallow natural lagoon that covers an area of 37 square kilometers. Some parts of the lakefront have development, but the portion closest to the city center is quiet at the moment. A new $18 billion residential, commercial, and tourist project is planned and could be finished within the next 10 to 15 years. There is one spot that I really enjoyed. In this location, which is underneath a major highway, every support has been enhanced by artists. There are probably a hundred of these literal pieces of street art. They provide color to an area that would otherwise just look bland. I enjoyed simply walking under the road, seeing what the various artists had done with their unusual canvases. I stayed six or seven kilometers away from the city center in what to me looked like an upper middle class neighborhood. It was a sweet part of town with a mix of old and new. This was my Airbnb, a great place with lots of room and attractively furnished. My cost for five weeks was $959. My favorite place in the neighborhood was back of town. It's a coffee shop. I went there every day of my stay unless I was away on an overnight or day trip. The look and atmosphere was amazing. Whenever I come here, I always get the cappuccino. But when I said, let me get a shot or two of you bringing me the cappuccino, they said, try the cheesecake. It's wonderful. So I'm trying the cheesecake and it looks fantastic. That is so good. The cheesecake is creamy. It is a salty, sweet concoction. The chocolate is amazing. This is a winner. The chocolate was rich, but the cheesecake was light. I savored every morsel of the dessert. That huge piece of cheesecake with the cappuccino cost a total of $5.17. The owner was so nice that he gave me an inside look at what made the dessert so good. Cheesecake San Sebastian, it's uh, something, uh, it's a combination between something sweet and something salty. It's very delicious, very delicious, very tasty. I watched as he melted the Belgian chocolate put on top and as my cappuccino was made. It all came together quickly. Now our Sebastian is ready. The final piece was adding the topping, which was done at the table. This will most definitely be my tastiest memory of my time in Tunisia. There is plenty to like about Tunis. Everything from the charm and wonder of the Medina, to the history and beauty of the Bardo Museum, to the colors of the municipal market. It's been a pleasure getting to know this place. I'll remain in Tunisia for the next several weeks. My idea is to branch out from my base here to explore some other fascinating places in this part of the country. You definitely don't want to miss what's coming up on Old, Alone, and Far From Home.